So I love this quote by Anais Nin, where she says, we write to taste life twice in the moment and in retrospection. I think that's very important because we actually become wiser in the retrospection. If we have taken what we've learned and we're now applying it to the point where we can teach others. And I'm sure you've all seen that in yourselves in corporate situations and others where it's like, oh, if I actually learned from this, now I have this beautiful, what we call in storytelling, the elixir of life. You come back from your journey armed with something extraordinary to be able to share with others. And so this tasting life twice ends up being a a beautiful boon and a gift for you and so many others. Uh, Raven uh, will be putting in, if she hasn't already, a link for a beautiful workbook for you. Uh, uh, You should have received one yesterday and then we have another one for today. If you are having any technical issues, just please reach out to her. She might be under Brianna or Raven um, on her uh, on her little thing and in the chat, and then she'll be able to get that for you. All right. One thing that we were too rushed to talk about that I just simply want to spend one moment on is this, this sense of making sacred versus sacrifice. Okay, if you make sacred, make sacred a writing space, make sacred in creating beauty in your in your writing space, quiet, um, a place where you're free of distractions, because one of the things I wanted to share with you, I love this distractions are what we let others do to us. Other characters in Netflix, detractors that say writing's really not important. Come to the store with me and buy toilet paper (laughs) during COVID. But excuses are what we do to ourselves. And so get rid of distractions and then allow yourself to also get rid of excuses so that you'll sit down and write. Emotions cause us to do all kinds of things like the laundry before our writing, everything else before our writing. So commit to yourself that you're going to start with a new day and a new time. The other thing is to schedule out your writing. Uh, You are all very busy women and men. And I will tell you something, if you don't put it in your planner, it's not going to happen. So schedule it out, give it as an appointment to yourself, and then you'll be like, I have an open space of two hours. (laughs) And then also realize everyone has different schedules. And this is part of that mindset, but also of compassion, because some people only have 15 minutes to write in the morning before they rush off to work. Some people have three days a week that they can write. So never compare yourself to another author. Comparison is the greatest source of pain. Instead, celebrate every moment that you have to write and then celebrate even more when you have written. We're going to do a lot more with our roadmap today. We're going to cover all kinds of things. And so I'm going to move through things very quickly. Linda is going to make sure that you have access to this recording too, in case we go super fast and you want to have some time to digest something a little bit more. Seth Godin said, here's the thing. The book that will most change your life is the book you write. The act of writing things down, of justifying your actions, of being cogent and clear and forthright, that's how you change. And I promise you that that is what I see. All right. So I'm hoping that most of you had an amazing time doing your homework last night. This conflict character arc is something that enables every great writer in nonfiction and fiction to be able to get at the heart of the story, the heart of the matter, faster and more clearly, because there's no room for lies. You are actually exposing the lies. You're taking the lies out of the equation, right? Um, Quick story about an author that came to me. After my book came out on Oprah, I had like 200 authors that came and they're like, I want you to write my book. I want you to write my book. There was one woman from California. She drove all the way to Utah with her son, ended up at a hotel about 20 miles from my house and said, I'm here. I was like, what do I do with this? So I took my laptop down. I thought I might as well at least listen to what she has to say. She had been, um, she had been raised to care for her parents like a domestic servant. 
And her entire life was to serve mom and dad. And that's all she did. She barely had an education. Um, she, she cleaned the house. She cooked. She did everything for, she had these wonderful upstanding parents in the community, right? Mom was an RN and dad did all these other things and had a great reputation. Then all of a sudden she's 40 years old and mom and dad die within quick succession of each other. And she doesn't have anything and she's bereft. Then she finds out mom and dad are not the upstanding citizens that she thought they once were. Mom, the, R the RN, registered nurse, had been dealing in black market babies. And then she found out she was one of them and had been bought for the price of a washing machine. So when she told me this, I was like, oh, because what I want to share with you is everyone is the victim of something. So on the left side of the curve where you begin, what, what happens is something happens to you that's such an incredible change in your life or something, but something happens to you where you are a victim of something, these lies, a victim of something. And on the other side of your learning curve of your character arc, is you being the victor, you rising from this. And not only does this make for extraordinary storytelling, whether you're giving a speech or doing a TED talk or writing your book, it also helps you realize the deeper truth of who you really are. So this is some of the most powerful work that you can do. You, were, you all heard or saw something within her story about your own. I hope that you're going to get down to this, this place because in this place of what your goal was, and then you find God and the universe or whatever you want to call it had a bigger plan for you than even what your goal was to start. And, and so you find that you have become refined by these buffeting winds. You, you find that in, in the darkness of these rises, but the falls especially, that, that there are, like I said yesterday, seeds to your greatest glory. And that's what's important to explore. And then in self-help, you are going to share. And not only are you going to share story, but you're also going to share principles that you have learned. And then depending on what kind of genre you're going to show, you're going to show actual tools that will assist other people in their journey. So let's get to um, some real specifics. Uh, this is such an incredible genre and I love that it is win-win. <laughs> And I say that it often has a built-in audience and it's because someone has been through what you've been through and maybe they didn't write about it or maybe they're going through it now. But when you pick a topic, I want you to think we have, you know, 8 billion people out there and there is definitely people who are having the same issue. Like how many attorneys are coming up into the world and they're like, this sucks. Lydia, I remember um, being that trucking company owner and I had a, um, uh, he was my top salesman and he came into my room, into my uh, office and he said, boss, there are no ethics in business. And I told him, I said, Mike, you're right. There are no ethics in business. It's up to us as people to bring ethics to business. So there will be people who are even outside of the law realm who are going to want to know, how did you do it? How could I do it? What are some of those principles that you learned and discovered along the way? And were you mentored or did this come by just, you know, tooth and nail or were there, were there um, kind of a mixture of both? And what are your guiding principles that you can turn around and then share with others? And, you know, you're going to teach people to be open to the fact that there are good people in every single industry, especially that one. So that will be good. So this, this credibility that you're looking at and that you're creating in your everyday life is what we're going to pour out on paper. And I want you to think about this. What are some of the problems that have kept me up at night? 
that wake me up at two or three in the morning that I finally solved. And now I have this elixir of life that I can give to others. Well, let's get into that because I want you in your own vehicle of life to not be afraid of the rough patches that you've been through and to recognize, like we were saying yesterday, this is how you got your vehicle going. You could hear that from Liddy. And I hope that you heard some of those sparks of passion from yourself. Like I'm doing what I'm doing now because of what I've lived. This makes you what we call a lived expert. But I want to, you know, I'm hoping that it's stirring thoughts and feelings and passion for not just what you've been through, but what you want to do with it in your life. First, we got to figure out, though, what exactly am I writing? So there's self-help, personal development, then there's leadership development and business. Then do it yourself, right? Which is, um, hey, here's how to build this craft project or how to put in a garden or how to make um, this particular kinds of recipes using no meat, okay? Then there's things like building confidence, usually in a specific area, organizational techniques, relationships, dieting and health, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on. There are all kinds of things. For today, I'm going to focus on um, you because knowing that you came through leadership channels, recognizing that you're likely here because you are a leader in your industry and that you have the desire to pass on that elixir to someone else. So think about what do you know best? What are you living right now? And then also, where do you see yourself five years from now if you can continue to progress in what you're doing in a remarkable way? And, and then um, the stars begin to align, if that makes sense, where you have been and where you are going. If you neglect either of those, it's, it's not going to work as well. But if you put those two things together, your vision, as I was mentioning, your reticular activating system is going to start to see oh my goodness, this story that I lived actually applies to this principle. You'll, you'll start to really get some ideas of, I do have something remarkable to say. And so that's important. One thing I do want to share with you is your voice that is so important. It's it, in every single style of writing, no matter where you come from. Richard Banks says, in writing nonfiction, the voice is critical because the reader is asked to trust and believe that the material is true. Okay, it's written in a book. It must be true. He says that voice must be one of authority or at least be honest and believable. So I'm going to take that a step further, that it's not just honest and believable, but that you are transparent. Because the more, more transparent you are, the less skeletons in the closet you're going to have that, that are going to keep you from writing this book. So be raw and vulnerable in that transparency. Doesn't mean that you have to share all your dirty laundry. There are um, things that you can say, but remember, every hero or shero has fatal flaws. So be be willing to say, this is, these are some places where I messed up. And then I learned these incredible, incredible uh, concepts and principles from this lived experience. Now, authority is important because you being an author gives you instant credibility. I've told you, like, people will start calling you, wanting you to be on stages, wanting you to come teach courses, wanting you to do things. It's, it's an instant credibility builder. There is a sovereign and self-authority voice inside of you that has lived these things. And I also want you to be aware that, you know, if, if you work with a, a coach or a mentor or an editor, and especially those of you who say, I've got this great idea, I don't have a lot of time to write, I'm going to hire a ghostwriter. Make sure that your voice is honored in the whole process. I had a, a woman come to one of my retreats and it broke my heart. She brought a sample of a book that she'd had ghost written. And she said, I'm not in it. it. Has my name on it, but I'm not anywhere in there. And I was like, oh, to spend that kind of money to produce something so beautiful and her own stories, her own voice wasn't even showcased. 
So honor your voice and your own authority. Believe yourself so that the reader will believe you. Okay. But it is going to take um, this everything, you know, Wikipedia and your bios and everything that you do, start giving yourself credit that you deserve and then being in alignment with this, this, the leader that you are, the leader that you see yourself as, as you're growing over the next few years as well. And um, one thing is that a lot of people are like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not like Dr. Liddy. I don't have a degree. I, I'm not an expert in this. Well, the thing of it is, is that if you have this lived conflict character arc and you're out on the other side as a victor, you are the consummate expert to be able to tell this book. Okay, to be able to share and to show it. And if you have a PhD or a master's, dang girl, dang boy, that's awesome. Flaunt it. Use it because you're already doing something with credibility and those letters on the end, they only add to it. The only thing that I would say is don't let that be your only credibility factor. Because there are some people that won't pick up a book if it has a PhD behind it because they're looking for someone who will understand them. They're looking for someone who understands that pain and they're looking for real solutions, okay? So if you've got the training, flaunt it, but then that deep level of vulnerability so that you are so approachable, it's very important. And um, the other thing that I was mentioning is just, all five of these people that are on this particular picture could be writing a book on leadership. I'm going to tell you, it would be a different book for every single one of them because of their voice and their experiences and their perceptions, the way they see the world. Uh, when my New York Times bestseller, uh, The Witness War Red, came out, it was pretty funny because about the same time there was another book on polygamy that came out. It was a New York Times bestseller, too. And the moment I heard about that, because they were about the same time, there was that little, you know, voice of ego that was like, oh, crap, we're going to be compared and there's going to be this and there's going to be that. And then I read the title and it says, it's not about the sex my ass. <laughs> and it was this hilarious story of a woman who actually chose into polygamy. Most don't, most grow up in polygamy and that's all they know. And then they struggle to get out. She chose in, and it's a hilarious book about, you know, what, what ended up happening. But I thought two women, approximately the same age, writing about the same subject and completely different books. And I have learned to trust that. Sometimes I'll have four authors in a class and we're doing really intensive work. And it feels like at first that they all are telling the same, like they have the same principles or they're because they're all working to be transformational and inspirational. And then we get down to the nitty gritty of beliefs and overcoming beliefs and principles. And suddenly, wham, it becomes extraordinary. So trust that. Also, <laughs> you might see on YouTube that there's these influencers getting loud and proud and they're catching audiences, okay? And so to a degree, I want you to think about how can I develop my personality in the book so strongly that my very essence drips from the page? This is what I call writing juicy. You make sure that, that your reader can actually live a part of your life through you. So sometimes we want to be really humble or we don't want people to think we're all that and a bag of chips. Be all that and a bag of chips. They need you. But you don't have to be crazy with a megaphone. Just be you. That's what's most important. And trust that your content is king or queen. Now, when we get to topics, sometimes you're like, okay, well, I want to write about leadership. Well, leadership is this really broad topic, right? So you want to get specific. So that means distilling down this essence of you and distilling it really all the way down. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but over the last... 18 months, 
we have more written information than all of human history up until the last 18 months. So think about that, all of human history, and then just the last 18 months, we have more than all of that. There is a lot being written. And so the question becomes, how do I rise above the din? How do I make something extraordinary? Well, I'm gonna tell you one thing that we're discussing on this call, and that is quality, and then we're going to get into niche ability with your topic. So you want to choose wisely, okay? There's thousands, millions, all kinds of topics for you to choose from. Get to your core. Get to who you really are and where you want to be and start working in that, that area. Um, do you want to tell you how to books are skyrocketing? And what's, you know, more than memoir, more than about any other book and as far as lending credibility to a leader and to help to build a platform, it is also extraordinary. So I would tell you not to be afraid of it and actually really to go for it. Um, I also want you to, to recognize that Audible books are skyrocketing like crazy. They are the, the fastest growing segment of the market. And so... You know, if you're a leader that is also a speaker, you will want to be the voice of your own book, okay? And and just enjoy the journey. Like you will learn so much about yourself, but be excited for what you can create. Um, one of the things that is so important, like I was mentioning is like perspectives. And so what if there were two people from the same office who were writing on the same topic? Again, where you come from, the education level that you have, what makes you a character all your own is going to be a differentiator. Why am I hitting this home so hard is because your ego is going to try to say it's already been done or someone can do it better or someone's already done it better. No, they haven't. As humans, we're evolving and we need new, fresh perspectives. So trust that instinct that brought you to this class and keep on going. Here's some indications of a few books on leadership that are out right now. And you'll find like, wow, look at all these leadership things. But I want you to see like vision to results and get real with authenticity. Then there's from the ground up, a journey to reimagine the promise of America. Well, that one doesn't sound like the other two. There's the connector manager, contagious you. Unlock your power to influence, lead, and create the impact that you want. Like, ooh, already in just the title. So choose something disruptive. Choose something where you can take a stand. Choose something where you are great to be able to stand out because you're going to need to and don't be afraid to. And publishers are looking for fresh voices and they're begging for fresh perspectives. Every time I talk to agents in New York, every time I talk to the larger literary agencies, they are begging for new and fresh voices, especially in leadership. I have a lot of great friends, six and seven figure speakers old white males. And they say they're tired of them. <laughs> they love fresh perspectives and they're begging for new leaders on the market. I'm going to give you an indication of how your lived experience can absolutely be phenomenal. This is one of our authors, Jason Coombs. Jason was in business, like a lot of you, he was a salesman for a local television company. He was on top of the world. He came from a doctor. Um, all his siblings were doctors and dentists. And he was constantly trying to prove himself because he wasn't really doctor material. Um, he was an adventurer, loved sports, all of these things, got injured and got addicted to opioids. Jason suddenly lost his home lost a child, lost his wife, lost his life. He ended up on the streets of Salt Lake City with nothing and, and just begging to try to find where his next fix was going to be. He sunk that low and more than once and had, um, uh, he was involved in this opioid ring that you probably have heard about throughout the United States. And there was a big one here. It was a big deal. 
finally, he hit rock bottom. He was able to, um, through a divine source, was able to really come to grips with who he really is. And through 12 steps and other things and a, a resource center, he was able to get clean and stay clean. Now, here's the cool thing. Jason has um, two recovery centers now. And this book was meant for the family members that he sees struggling, millions upon millions upon millions. So you think of every opioid addict, and there are way too many. There are seven to 10 family members who are like, I don't know what to do when they're pulling their hair out. He knew if he wrote a book to a drug addict that it wasn't going to get so far. Number one, they can't think enough to read a book. But the family members who are scraping and trying to survive. So I'm going to tell you something. Jason gets emails and texts that he sends me every day of people who are so grateful because he taught them that when they have a drug addict in their family, a tsunami is coming and to get off the beach. So what are they doing? They're getting off the beach. He shows his story up front because he wants the family members to understand what happens to the mind of a brilliant person who undergoes addiction. And then in the rest of the book, he talks about motivational interviewing and all kinds of things that they can do. Number one, to let go and, and not deny their addict his or her pain so that they can hit rock bottom. And then also how to empower them, motivational interviewing, these other things, concepts that most family members had no clue that, that they could help, but it's in different ways that are more healthy. So I'm sharing this with you because I had two authors at the same time that wanted to write a really strong self-help book. Most of them, or both of them had extraordinary stories. Jason sat down to write every day. The other person sat down to write every day. Jason chose to absolutely be of service because he knew the pain and he said, I can do something with this. The other person has never published her book. And it's because she's going after fame and wealth and platform and has not gotten to the heart of who she is where her pain has resided, how she can be that elixir to someone else. It's this powerful and each of you have it, which is why we started with that conflict character arc. So niche ability, this is where your uniqueness comes out. This is where you as a leader all of a sudden are not like every other leadership person. You are your very own and this gives you traction. It gives you traction, it makes you fresh. Now, in your workbook, we have some really strong things to help you hone down that message um, and then also deep work on your avatar. So you heard from me yesterday. If you could have an intimate conversation with one person that you know would benefit from your message, your story, and your principles, really get to the core of it with your avatar. This distills things down like crazy. So in your, in your workbook, you'll have these exercises like who's my avatar, you go into pain, you want to be specific. Remember, everyone wants to sell millions of books, but you cannot have all their voices in your head and do a great job. Instead, you want to be doing a great job for that person and the ripples expand. I have amazing stories of what happens when you speak to one avatar and Stories and books begin to have a life of their own. When you choose to be of service, you will see your ripples later and in beautiful and remarkable ways. That's why my books have been on Oprah and Dr. Phil and CNN and made all of these things. It's not that I'm the best writer in the world. It is great people that give me great content and then our choice to serve the one so that it might ripple to many. I wish I had time for stories, but I don't. <laughs> okay, so these are all your lovely workbook exercises, and I'm going to invite you to do them while the fire is hot, okay? So if you get a chance to do it tonight or give yourself an hour or two this weekend to answer these questions, it's going to serve you. 
William Foster said this, quality is never an accident, is always the result of high intention. Since effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution, it represents wise choice of me, the wise choice of many alternatives. So what does that mean? It just means that you do the research, you give yourself the opportunity to make wise choices along the way. And may I say, when you choose to be of service, there is an intuitive force that rises within you that helps you make wiser decisions. You're going to start to see opportunity everywhere you turn around. And the beauty of it is that you'll start to grow that mechanism within you that helps to make wise decisions. Okay. I had, um, after my first book came out, I had a gentleman who uh, wrote to me and he's like, wrote an email at first, called him on the phone. And he's like, you're my author. I just know you're my author. And I've had a few people do that, but he had been in a gang and an international mafia had laundered lots of money, had killed a lot of people. And he thought that I was his author because I wrote a book called Skinhead Confessions from hate to hope. He didn't read the tagline. He didn't read the book at all. <laughs> he just read that those first two things and said, that's my author. He wanted to aggrandize all the horrific things he'd done. He's like, I kept telling him no. And he's like, we'll make a movie. We'll be rich. We'll be this. I said, I am not your author. So the cool thing that happens is you begin to rise in visibility and more opportunities come. And because of the work you're doing, you're going to say, this is me. This is not me. And it's going to assist you to make more and wiser decisions. Do you know why I knew I was not his author? Because I had a why for writing my book that had to do with my victim to Victor, my own character arc. Mother Teresa said, I am the pen in the hand of a God who is writing a love letter to the world. And I said, that's me, not Mother Teresa. But I knew my why. I invite you to know yours. When you sit down to write, when you have this opportunity to serve, when people come to you because you are the problem solver of whatever it might be, and then you're going to see that you have probably more than one book in you and give yourself an opportunity to think about those ideas too. But I will tell you this, one book finished is better than 11 started. I know this from personal experience. And so give yourself that opportunity. And when you're ready, start speaking about it. Write more than you speak, but start telling people because people network. And the people that love you and want to support you will introduce you to agents, introduce you to publishers, introduce you to mentors who will help you get your book going. Like, Start speaking about it. There is a power in the spoken word as well as the written word. Okay, we're going to get down to some brass tacks. Um, part of your roadmap, this massive action plan, um, for most of us has to do with some sort of outline, okay? And some people are plotters and some people are pantsers. <laughs> and this is a joke for a running joke and anyone who's author in fiction and nonfiction. Some people like to meticulously left brain get everything out tooth and nail and probably 24 bullets and then other people are like oh storytellers and right brain and this and that but they sometimes really struggle to have a format or a journey that you take your reader on so uh what's wonderful is to know which one you are so that you can rein in or expand and enhance the other if you're very left brain you're probably going to want to do some things to juicify your writing. You're going to want to, you know, begin to practice expressing yourself and storytelling and character and scene and emotion. And if you happen to be a pantser, you are likely more expressive and more of a storyteller. And you're going to have to give your left brain some time to get some work done. OK, so use your gifts, but then also get some help in the arenas where you might um, struggle and don't be embarrassed if you deserve a little outside help. I, I know very few authors who have written and edited and published and launched their book all on their own. Usually we have some areas that where we ask for help and then it makes it better. So let's go through some important steps in your structures and your outlines. 
Step one is to write an introduction to your self-help. So explain who you are. Remember that lived expert? We want to know why, as the reader, you are the expert. Why should we trust you? Why should we believe you? How are you uniquely qualified for this uh, amongst other people? And then why did you decide to write this book? What is it that is compelling you? Why do you know you have to write this book? And here's where I'm going to share with you. I have a couple of amazing authors on this call who have really done some deep inner work. And at first they thought their book was going to be one thing. And then it turned out to be something stronger, deeper, more impactful, incredibly effective. And what it came from was really why were they writing in the first place? And it has allowed them to be vulnerable at such a level that their impact and their influence through their words is greater. Because as readers, we want to know, how is it that you see the world? And how did you come to this? Okay, now I know I can trust you. Simon Sinek said, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let us know what drove you to write this book, what compelled you. And it's usually either joy and bliss, or it's pain. 75 to 85% of the time, it's pain. And then you found your bliss on the other side of your character arc. (laughs) Step two is to sketch out. I really invite you to do this part. Sketch out several principles or tenets that are all part of the core of your mighty message, right? So let's say that your mighty message is on spiritual leadership. And your mighty message, different from anyone else out there that has a message on spiritual leadership, is that um, what some people consider the lowest form of human life can actually teach us the most and become the most incredible leaders. And so that's your that's your mighty message. Well, then you would have seven principles with stories to go along with it that back up the principles that you are um, that you are teaching. And so think about that mighty, mighty message when you figured out your topic and then list out those principles. And then once you've listed those out, then think about the stories that are going to help to um, to really qualify that. I would say start off with 10 chapters at a minimum if you're doing a normal self-help book. You know, if you've got a cookbook, it's going to be something different. If you're doing, you know, craft projects, but I'm talking to you as leaders that likely something that you're doing, you're going to want to have 10 chapters at the minimum. Okay. Step three is to weave in specifics now. Okay, so, you know, you know how you're going to start and how important it is to lay all that groundwork out and pour yourself out to the reader. And now you've really got to also express how is it that you know about this pain and what are they facing? So you can give statistics. You can let us know, you know, how prevalent this is a problem in the world, how many billions of dollars are wasted on this problem, how um, how families are split apart or um, corporations fail or whatever it might be in regards to your mighty message. And then um, and then be that empathetic expert. OK, that's that's part of that beauty of your credibility. Now, in chapter one or two, you I like to do it right up front. Um, when you mention the pain, also give the promise. I have noticed that some prolific authors that do this well, they also may do it in chapter two, but they never wait somewhere else in the book. In one or two, there is a promise. So I want you to think about this. Okay, what is my promise? Well, if you follow these principles and tenets, if you work on the self-help using the tools that I'm giving you and offering you, then this is what you're going to see on the other side. And how do you know you can promise that? Because if they work the steps that you worked. So this is why you're not picking something out of the blue that you think would be cool to write on. You're picking something that you know from inside. Later on, as you get better and more prolific as an author, you can go into books where you're exploring things. And because you already have credibility, people want to go on that journey with you. For your first book, because the first book is always really important, make sure that that level of vulnerability is prevalent in your promise. Okay. 
And then in chapter three and subsequent chapters, I like to do with my students what we call power chapters. So you you give a level of consistency. Notice Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That is not the only way to write a self-help book, but I'll tell you what, it was an effective way to write a self-help book because people knew what they were getting. And then he was very straightforward in the way that he presented, and they knew they could count on certain things every time there was a habit, okay? Now you're going to see like Glennon Doyle and several others that are doing like this beautiful thing with story and with the principles, and some of the principles surprise you because of the level of storytelling, um, and, and it just depends on how creative you are, but even then... Uh, Self-help means that you're giving them enough tools, not just your stories. They are going to love your stories because those stories are the essence of you and how you made through something and came out on the other side, remember? But they want to know that they can do it for themselves. And so you may find you're a great storyteller and you kind of suck at this part then look up other self-help books and go, how are they doing this? Oh, where am I feeling inspired? Oh, I really love this. How could I make my own meteor, right? You never want to copy, but imitation and creation and muse and, and inspiration is wonderful because now you have your own book. You don't need to copy anyone else's, but success leaves clues, so you're going to see what the best books have done, and then you see how to make yours even stronger. So here's this good rule of thumb. Start with that real world story with a lot of power. Explain that principle that goes with it. So story, and then the principle that you're teaching from that story, and then you can back it up. You know, statistics, articles, studies, jokes, all of those things, but make sure they're relevant. And then lay out tools. Give them the help in self-help. Sometimes that's asking questions, deep, diabolical, earth-shattering questions for them to see within themselves. Sometimes it's, you know, um, this is what I have found, these seven steps for the deepest meditation, right? So depending on what it is, and I will tell you, give tools that you have used. And then you can also expand. I also found this and I'm loving it. You know, I, I went to this particular class and it, it brought all this deeper clarity to me. So those kinds of things are beautiful. And then when you are done, you know, and you're teaching the principle, I forgot to tell you too, some people are really into statistics and they just think that they have to pack their books with lots of statistics. People don't remember statistics, but they do remember story. And um, people don't always remember everything you said, but they remember how you made them feel. So think about how you want them to feel after each chapter. Probably you want them to be intrigued and want to keep going. And then at the end of the book, you want to make sure that they feel wrapped in your book, supported and uplifted, educated, and even transformed. So when you're teaching a principle and you've given it in there, another story that really backs it up is really powerful in that, in that same chapter, okay? So uh, the other thing is to encourage a call to action each time, you know? I, I invite you to, to start thinking about this right away. Um, and then you could even have goalposts or signs or different things. And one thing that I didn't put in here that I would love to suggest that's really important for self-help. Oftentimes, these folks will be looking for you after they read the book. They're going to want to work with you if you've made this effective. So even if you have given your best, which please give your best, like don't go, well, it's a, it's a $19 book. I'm not going to give my all in this. If you give your all, you establish that no like and trust, and then they want to work with you because they they'll be saying she or he gave me all of this already, but I'm still struggling to take the steps. I need a witness. I need someone who's been through it. I need someone to walk beside me and you will be the first ones they will hire. So put in your very best. Don't hold back. Don't say, well, I've got a series of five books. 
We don't know what's going to happen in life. I mean, look what's happened over the last two years. My advice, my invitation to you is give your best now because other opportunities will evolve. Believe me. (laughs) And then we talked about a title that works. So be disruptive, clever, but not too clever because you want to make sure that either the title or the tagline actually gives them what they need. And we always say, We don't judge a book by its cover. That's not true. So you don't want it too wordy because you got to be thinking on Amazon, what are you looking for? A thumbprint. You have this size to determine which book you're going to get in a few words. So be really clear, have fun with the title, and then make sure that whatever you write up, um, either if you're self-publishing or if traditional publishing, make sure the words are strong, your essence is strong, your credibility is strong, and it will be beautiful. I'm going to get into something that I love, which is showing versus telling, and this is in the storytelling portion, okay? So one of the things that I like to teach is that if you tell your readers something, especially about pain, and the overcoming of it, especially about maybe you and an antagonist, you know, whether that's cancer or divorce or an abusive someone or or whatever it might be, and you just tell us, we have to decide if we're going to believe you or not. But if you show us, all of a sudden, your whole world becomes approachable and accessible to us and we believe you. We may not believe exactly what you believe, but we know why you do, and it opens our perspectives. I'm gonna give you an example. Anybody a fan of Matthew McConaughey? It's really funny because some people love this man and some people can't stand him. And because of some of the characters, he's played very well in films. And because some people think, oh, he's that wealthy and you know, he's just a playboy and these other things. Well, he created what's really unusual, a memoir with self-help built in. It's called Green Lights. And it's something I would recommend to everyone about showing versus telling. Because in the very first chapter, you begin to see him as a humble hero because you cannot believe what his parents put him through. And you begin to have this understanding of, why he started to believe what he believed and what he began to become because of it. But you're actually rooting for him because he has vulnerability and he is not afraid to give his his fatal flaws. And and then he also has his redeeming qualities, which he's going to let you know about. But he can because he's Matthew McConaughey. But he is an exceptional storyteller, and um, he has really good showing. So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think so juicy in your writing that you bring the reader into the bathtub with you, and they can hear the the, the suds slush off to the side. They know how many bubbles you have in there. They know the temperature of the water and just how much room there is for their feet. Like, be that, okay? There is a reason for that, and most of it is that credibility. The other thing is, you've probably heard the old axiom uh, that never to judge another until you have walked a mile in their shoes. A book is one of the most excellent ways to let someone walk a mile in your shoes, to really understand your deeper motivations, your mistakes, as well as your beautiful triumphs. And so this telling versus showing, showing versus telling, it makes a difference in self-help books as well as in memoir. And so I invite you to have some fun with that. Uh, I'm going to give you one example. My second book, Shattered Silence, um, it came out when Oprah and Dr. Phil decided to come back together again for the first time after being away for years and years. So it was a big deal. And Melissa was the guest. Melissa Moore, who was the daughter of the happy face serial killer. And the thing of it is, is that when her father's victims heard that she had written a book and was publishing it, they were furious. 
And before the book came out, there were all kinds of nasty things in the media saying, you know, your father already victimized us and now you're going to do it again. And saying that she should not profit from her father's killings. But I knew that nobody should profit from killing, but that everyone could benefit from healing. And so we just kept moving forward. The book came out and there were those of her father's victims, families who read Melissa's story and who understood her. You see, there's this thing that we think the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And so family members must be just like that person. And they came to find out that she was just as much of a victim of her father's stories and his lies and what he had done to ruin her life. And all of a sudden they said, we we didn't know. And there became compassion. And Melissa actually became a producer in LA and is known for bringing compassion to true crime. She became a leader due to her vulnerability, wrote a book like nothing had ever been written before. So in showing, she did a lot of showing and it engendered compassion, knowledge and expansion. That's exactly what you deserve to do. So here's some benefits. You let your reader into a world they wouldn't know or understand. You help them to find this potent meaning in their own lives. And for self-help leaders who deserve to grow a platform and grow a business, it establishes trust. It really does. So I want you to think about that in your own way. Like, how can I show? How can I do this beautiful thing? So in crafting certain elements, we're going to have some fun with this because um, I want you to practice owning your author's voice. Okay, Um, there's just a couple of things here, like, would I really say that in my own head? Sometimes we write a different way than we were actually thinking at the time. You know what readers want from you? What were you thinking at the time, not later? Okay, (laughs) and then what do I sound like when I'm talking to myself? Because this inner dialogue is part of a show me story, and it is so strong, so strong. One of my authors I was working with just this morning, his His father um, was convicted of of killing his mother and his stepmother, but always claimed that he was completely innocent. And at one point in time, Todd became, he became a, a military policeman, so he knew how to do investigative work. He began to question his father's innocence and went to, um, uh, have a, have a come to Jesus meeting for lack of a better term at the moment. He's having a conversation out loud with his dad, but in his mind, he's having another conversation where he's getting angrier and angrier because his dad won't admit to it. Finally, his dad, two weeks later, decides he's going to call the siblings together and admit what he had done with one of the murders, not the other one. So he says, I did this thing, and he talks about it, but then he says, I didn't kill your stepmother. And Todd's immediate reaction is like, bull, da, 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 right? Because he knew better, but he didn't say that out loud because he knew if he shut his father down, he wouldn't get all the details and things that he'd been needing to put the puzzle pieces of his own life back together. So he had his inner dialogue and, and then the outer dialogue. So I want you to be thinking about that. And then, whoops, I went too fast. But use strong verbs Like instead of just walk, it's saunter, stroll, gallop, skip, amble. You know, instead of just running, lope, spring, dash, scuttle. Have some fun. Paint that picture. Okay. And then, um, you know, they say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. You don't have to use a thousand words to paint a picture. I often tell my authors, what could you replace this with that's juicier? Where could you be more descriptive in the storytelling? Where can you let your walls down of vulnerability in your showing? It's powerful. Include sensory details, okay? Smells, taste, touch, all of those senses. And some of you are very in tune with a sixth sense. And so show us that as well. Very sentence structure, short and long, change it up so they enjoy it. When the tension is heightening, shorter sentences. You're going to leave your reader going, 
because they can't wait for the next sentence to come along. If it's long and rambling, you lose them. Short ones are great. Use dialogue. I call it dramatic dialogue, right? If it's like, don't leave. And instead of, don't you dare walk out of her, out of here, the bitter lover at the next table yelled. That's so much better than the woman next to us was angry. <laughs> so those kinds of things. And then the inner dialogue that I already talked to you about. And just remember, even as you see me, I'm not Italian, but I'm very expressive with my hands. What is your body language when you're angry, excited, upset, um, blissfully joyful when you're in love? What do you start to do? You know, what do other people in your sphere start to do? And always with dialogue and also interactions in show me stories, there is what I love to call the call and response. So you say something, someone else says something. And there's all the things going on inside of you and your body language. And then there's all the things you don't know what they're saying to themselves, but you see a look across their face. You see them fumble nervously with their hands or switch their feet or ball their hands into fists. All of those things are necessary, important for the best show me stories in body language. Um, just have fun with this. <laughs> I have one more example. Uh, he shoved back his chair and slammed his fist against the table looking at me instead of saying he was tired, <laughs> right? Um, or uh, he could yawn, groan, and stretch. So just have fun with this. Grandma had the kindest eyes, although in the strangest way. They seemed to swallow you whole and spit you back up again, this time a better person. So lots of different ways that, that you can do things. All right, um, I'm going to invite you as we're closing up this, not to neglect your date with destiny. I have found that when someone takes a class or has the gumption to write something, they've either been told you have a story. Would you please write a book? Or there is something deep inside of them that says, life will not be complete until I have written this story. And what I want to share with you is that writing the story is the beginning. Like it is beautiful and wonderful. And so to give yourself an opportunity to have that date with destiny, books open amazing doors. I'd also like to say, that when you're writing, I mentioned writing for yourself the first time, and then the best writers, they rewrite. I've only known one person from the dawn of history that I've ever met <laughs> until now that has completely downloaded a book without having to go back and rewrite. And even then, I would say that there were some things that could have been done to make it better. Okay. And then I also invite you to have beta readers. When you get to a form where you're like, this is the best that I can make it, use beta readers to give you input before you send the book out. We all have blind spots and you deserve for those to be, um, to be fleshed out before you have your published book. And, and here's the thing, like when Shattered came out on Oprah and then I reread my book, nobody pointed it out to me, but I realized I had messed up the timeline. <laughs> I was like, <gasps> I was horrified. But then I used it as a beautiful skill. I now give a timeline and a left brain, right brain course to all of my authors because <laughs> I learned so much that I used in my next books that made them so much better. And I want other people to be able to have that. So you will make some mistakes, but it's, it's, if it doesn't get out there, it's not going to have any ripple. So be the person that serves and loves and then learn from any lessons that you have and then use those to move forward into being an even better writer. And one last thing on this is to allow for the deepening. A lot of times we start off thinking, I have this one thing to tell. And then the energy of the story takes over and teaches us something bigger, deeper, broader, wider, more powerful and impactful than we could have ever imagined. 
When we give ourselves time, I have seen this happen with every story. If you're going for a legacy story, allow for the deepening. If you have a new program and it's coming out in 60 days and you got to have a book, okay. But you will be writing when you're not writing. Listen to those voices. You'll be in the shower. You'll be up on the mountain for a hike. You'll be out on the horses. You'll be doing the dishes and talking to your kids and bam, something will happen. Trust that. Put it into play. Have some fun with it. So um, one of the things I want to say is every good author deserves a good editor. Please, please, please make sure you get a good editor. If you traditional publish, a traditional um, editor will be made available to you. And depending on the size of the publisher will be dependent on the skill levels likely of the, of the editors. Um, if you are into your self-publishing, Please do not let that book go out into the public without having an editor. It is worth the investment. Um, you know, we've talked about people having books in their basement or up on the shelf and they're so embarrassed of it that they won't even pull it out. That's the last thing that you deserve. So um, we do not have enough time to go into publishing options. And so um, what I want you to know is that you can always, 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 always self-publish. It is a thing now, and it used to carry like this, oh, you have to self-publish. Now it's like many, many, many people are doing it. So I have a free program on my website, and um, our website is yourinspiredstory.com. I'll show it to you in a moment. But there is a free program called Author Unleashed Going Pro, and it gives you lots of pros and cons into publishing. I personally think every book has a place. And so I love to support authors. If they're traditional publishing, I help them get an agent. I help them through that, that business proposal of your, of your book, you know, the book proposal. But if you're indie publishing, then you have a different road. So every author comes upon this path and then there's time to split. And it just depends on your book. It depends on timing. It depends on speaking. It depends on if you have a program coming out. It depends on if you want to make use of someone else's resources. It's, it's all it's all subjective. So you, you want to become more knowledgeable in that one. Okay. So um, I did want to let you know, we started Inspired Legacy Publishing. Uh, this is new for us in the last year, but we have teamed up with an extraordinary international team and expanded it. Um, they have over 300, excuse me, 800 published guaranteed national and international bestsellers under their belt and our authors are starting to go through the process. I did it because we had some extraordinary stories that were coming out but not all of them had a fit for traditional publishing. They were either um, too soon for their time or they wanted to publish right away because they have this amazing gift to give and programs and other things, knowing that at another time they might self-publish. Also, people who are fairly business savvy are doing this all over the place because they want to keep 90% of the proceeds. And so there's pros and cons. Um, I just want you to know this is a celebration for us because we found an affordable way to really help people get out there in a tremendous way. And then another third of my authors are all traditional publishers. So we, we share other things with them. I also personally want to invite you to my Inspired Writers Retreat. We hold one about once a quarter. And then also um, I do a collaborative effort in Ireland in um, this one will be June of 2022. The Inspired Writers Retreat is a small, soft, sacred space where you can just be yourself. We have um, a professional chef who handles everything, including dishes. So all we have to do is learn about ourselves, focus on our book, and we have tremendous breakthroughs there. So I just wanted to extend that invitation to you. And to share with you a challenge. You will have more publishing options available to you if you make yourself a sure thing. Large traditional publishers, medium traditional publishers, small publishers, they're all looking for a sure thing. Self-publishing, you wanna be a sure thing, okay? So you're gonna to wanna to raise your visibility. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you're building your platform that the this area that you're dabbling into with your book, remember we wanna keep in mind 
where we're headed, the impact that we want to have on the world, what we're going to do with this beautiful knowledge that we have accumulated to give as a gift to the world and where we want to take ourselves. Who do we want to break bread with? Who do we, whose stages do we want to speak upon? Um, you know, where would we love to travel? As an author, I have been all around the world now, and I got to tell you, it's a lot more fun to be an author than not to be one. So I love for other people to have those beautiful experiences. It takes courage to write your words on paper, and it also takes courage for you um, to be visible and to, um, and to let yourself be that powerful. And when you do, there's just this beautiful thing called launching and celebrating. And so start talking, start thinking of ways and ideas that you can expand yourself, start seeing where you can be of service. This is the number one thing of that, that I share with you. And so remember that success leaves clues, read voraciously, see who is doing it well and doing it right and doing it hot. And you'll learn a lot along the way. And then it will be time for your celebration, which is going to be great. So um, I also wanted you to know that um, Raven is putting in a link for you if you want to book a free one-on-one -on -one session with me. And so feel free to take advantage of that and follow up. So she'll put that link in and then we'll get on the calendar. Whoops, because I just love spending that time with you. You know how we started with this quote, we write to taste life twice in the moment and in retrospection. She goes on to say, we write like Proust to render all of it eternal and to persuade ourselves that it is eternal. We write to be able to transcend our life and then to reach beyond it.